mentioned, uh, so this is part of our series of webinars for the LAIB program. Um, so today we'll be just talking a, a little bit about the influenza activities in the previous season. Um, we'll be talking about the flu vaccines that are available, the impact of flu on children, the evidence for school-based delivery. Um, we'll also be touching on the dose administration, contraindications for storage of the LAIB vaccine. Um, touch on a few um, frequently answered questions that come to us from healthcare professionals and vaccinators such as yourself uh, and also I'll be going through some of the practical considerations and resources available for you this flu season. So just to kind of, um, you know, uh, capture what happened in terms of flu activity, in terms of surveillance data for the last season, 22-23. Uh, so over 16,000 uh, laboratory confirmed cases of flu were notified to HPSE, which is our Health Protection Surveillance Centre. Uh, there were over 4,600 cases admitted into hospital with flu, 185 cases unfortunately admitted to critical care, particularly in the older adult age group. And unfortunately, there were also 198 deaths in flu. I have to stress, though, as well, this wasn't just the uh, only pressure, winter pressure last season. As you'll probably remember, there was RSV, flu and COVID co-circulating, which really compounded the, um, the winter pressures that we saw uh, on the health and care system last season. So this again just shows uh, a little bit of a, a graph around the um, age specific rates uh, per 100,000 in the different uh, age demographics. As you can see, you know, the older adults, you know, having the uh, the highest peak, followed by the youngest children, so age zero to four. So really seeing, you know, after older adults, children being impacted by flu last season. We also saw uh, flu activity. We have it. We keep an eye on flu activity, I suppose, um, within uh, uh, within uh, Australia as well for this particular flu season that they've just had in, in 2023 during our summer, I suppose. Um, uh, that's when their flu season was. And what they noticed was that the notification rates have been highest in people aged um, five to nine years, followed by children aged zero to four and children aged 10 to 14. So really children being impacted by flu in Australia there. And unfortunately, 72% of the people admitted with confirmed flu uh, across their Sentinel hospital sites were in the youngest um, uh, you know, in the younger children uh, under the age of 16. So really, again, um, children being impacted by flu, but also seeing hospitalizations in Australia with flu as well. So in terms of uh, the flu vaccines that will be available for this particular flu season that we have, there's just two flu vaccines. One is the injectable flu vaccine, which is Influac Tetra, which is our non-live quadrivalent influenza vaccine, or QIV. This comes in a pre-filled syringe for intramuscular injection. It's licensed for, for use from six months of age onwards. And it's manufactured by Mylan, and it has a one-year um, shelf life. Um, but as always, you know, look at the expiry date of the product of any vaccine before you administer it to a client. The second flu vaccine that we have available this season is our nasal flu vaccine called Fluence Tetra, which is a live attenuated influenza vaccine or LAIB. It comes as a nasal spray suspension and is licensed for use from 24 months of age uh, to less than 18 years. So it can be used in children aged 2 to 17 years, in other words. It's manufactured by AstraZeneca. And the thing to note about this particular vaccine is that it has a short shelf life, so just 18 weeks from manufacturing. So just check the um, expiry date on the vaccine before before administering it to a client in particular. Um, so this is the presentation of the boxes that we have. So Interact Tetra on the left. Um, so this is a particular injectable flu vaccine and you'll be using it for children aged 6 to 23 months uh, who have those underlying health conditions, but also those 18 and over uh, who are eligible for the flu vaccine. Uh, and also it's used for children who are contraindicated LAIB as well. And on the right hand side is the vaccine we'll be talking about today, which is Fluenz Tetra. This is a live LAIB nasal spray suspension. And this is to be used in all children aged aged 2 to 12 years, and also in children aged 13 to 17 years at increased risk of influenza-related complications. I just wanted to touch on the recommended groups for vaccination. So there has been a change this year as per the Department of Health policy compared to the previous season. So last season, all children aged 2 to 17 were eligible for the free flu vaccine, but this year, only uh, children aged 2 to 12 years at the time of vaccination will be eligible for the free flu vaccine. Um, children aged 13 to 17 with underlying health conditions who are at risk, um, including those uh, on the right there, can still get the free flu vaccine. Um, 
but healthy children uh, aged 13 to 17 are no longer eligible this flu season. The other groups that are eligible includes um, older adults aged 65 and over, pregnant women, health and care workers, residents in care homes, um, carers and household contacts of those at increased uh, medical risk, people in regular contact with pigs, poultry and waterfowl, and also those um, a, you know, in the 6 to 23 month age bracket, and as I said, 13 to 64 age bracket with underlying health conditions such as those highlighted there. Um, just to move on to talk about, you know, why is flu so important in children? Why are we focusing on it? Even the WHO recommends that children under the age of five are given the, uh, the flu vaccine. This is because they're at greater risk of severe complications of flu or uh, or flu itself. Um, and the complications for um, for flu in children include bronchitis, otitis media, sinusitis, and secondary bacterial pneumonia. Less commonly, but obviously serious consequences can also include meningitis, encephalitis, and primary influenza pneumonia as well. And just to look at the surveillance data, I suppose, um, of flu in children, uh, you know, up to 10, you know, one in 10 children under the age of 15 attend their GP with influenza-like illness consultations each year, and the highest rates of flu are seen in younger children. This leads to excess doctor visits, hospital admissions, and also antibiotic prescriptions as well. And children under the age of five are in but, you know, are particularly at highest risk of complications. They have some of the highest, um, you know, age specific rates of um, hospitalization and also admission to critical care as shown as the graph on the right. So just looking at last year as well, looking at the burden of paediatric influenza, you'll notice um, from the surveillance data um, that's available on the HPSC website that over 1,200 children um, under the age of 15 were admitted into hospital last uh, flu season um, with flu. And when you look at over a 10 year period, I suppose the numbers really add up. So HBSC pulled together the surveillance data from 2009 season all the way to the 2018 season. And they noticed there was about 11,000 uh, cases of, of flu reported, around 4,750 confirmed hospitalizations, 183 critical care admissions, and unfortunately 41 deaths as well. And I always say this to people as well, that you know, um, when we look at these numbers, it's really important to remember that behind each of these numbers is a child and also their family that's been impacted by flu. And the other thing to remember about, you know, flu in children is that children can transmit flu for longer in adults, so 10 or more days, uh, compared to adults where, where, they, where they're transmitted for around six days. Um, and also children attending daycare centres and schools are important transmitters of flu in the community as well. For this reason, we offer the free flu vaccine to all children aged 2 to 12 years. And the aim of this is to reduce the mortality and morbidity on children itself directly from flu, uh, but also to reduce the number of people in the community with flu and reduce the number of hospital admissions, reduce the transmission to the elderly and you know persons in the at-risk groups, uh, reduce transmission to health and care workers uh, in families with children, and also reduce absenteeism of children from school and their parents from work as well. And I think this is particularly important in the winter time, you know, when we are expecting COVID-19, RSV and flu to circulate this season. So one of the questions we always asked about, you know, is the flu, does the flu vaccine work? You know, is it effective? So, um, you know, in some studies, um, actually LAIV has been shown to be more effective in children compared to the inactivated injectable flu vaccine. This is because LAIV contains live attenuated viruses, uh, which mimics natural infection. So induces a more durable memory response, uh, immune response. Uh, and it also provides longer, better longer term protection to children than the injectable flu vaccine. Um, and in addition, uh, LARV may offer some protection against strains not contained in the vaccine, as well as strains that have undergone antigenic drift. And also the flu vaccine effectiveness um, can vary by season, but it's also important to remember that uh, flu vaccines uh, you know, also reduce the severity of illness and complications from flu, and also reduce um, influenza-related hospitalizations and admissions to critical care units. So that's why we always say you know, vaccination remains the best protective measure uh, for prevention of flu. Uh, and the graph on the right is just from uh, Public Health England, PHE, um, looking at flu vaccine effectiveness in children aged 2 to 17 years over five seasons and how you know, it can vary. But as I said, you know, when you, when you think about effectiveness, it's not just about preventing flu, but it's also really important that even if they do get flu after having the flu vaccine, it does protect them from the severe consequences of flu, which can include, um, you know, hospitalisation and unfortunately deaths as well. 
so we looked at you know um, other areas you know where they where they've actually delivered the flu vaccine in schools uh, and the impact that this has had you know on uptake rates and also on the broader population level. So when you look at the uh, at the UK where they've been giving the flu vaccine in primary school aged children and they did the pilots in 2014-15, following which they've actually rolled it out to all children in primary age schools are uh, offered the vaccine in school. Um, they noticed that in the pilot areas uh, at that point in time that um, the children that were offered the flu vaccine where there's a high uptake base, there was a 94% reduction in, in GP influenza like endless consultations in that area. There was a 74% reduction in A&E respiratory attendances in those children and hospital admissions due to confirmed influenza was 93% lower in that particular um, population of children as well. But they've also noticed a wider societal benefit. For example, GP influenza-like illness consultations in adults was also 59% lower in those areas where children had a high coverage of the, the nasal flu vaccine. So we had a look at, you know, what the vaccine intentions are like uh, for um, our population here in Ireland. So we, we actually did a survey, a population representative survey, not too long ago, a couple of, a couple of years ago with, uh, with uh, Irish parents. And over 48% actually said, you know, they would be happy to get the flu vaccine. Around 23% weren't sure, you know, these would be the people who'd be amenable to getting information from trusted professionals such as yourself. We also did some research with another panel of um, uh, with another panel of parents um, more recently with core research and we asked them you know um, you know how likely are they to get the flu vaccine uh, and around 38 percent said yes you know we'd be happy to get the flu vaccine but more importantly you know we asked them you know if you are not planning to if you're not planning to get the flu vaccine you know what were the reasons why so 33 percent of them um you know said no we're not planning to get the flu vaccine and they don't intend to do that and the main reason why was that they weren't sure they, you know they didn't think that um children were at a serious risk of illness from flu uh, uh that was that came up to about 35 percent of them and around 28 percent of them didn't agree with the children's flu vaccine 23 percent were concerned about the safety aspects and about 12 percent was uh, you know they didn't think their child was at risk of getting flu and then there was another 29 percent of those um, who didn't get the flu vaccine at that time, but, you know, they intended to get them. So, you know, there's, there's you can see from a high proportion, you know, um, over 60 percent of of, of um, of people, you know, are in that more recent survey from core are, you know, intending to get the flu vaccine uh, for their child. So the intention for to get the vaccine is there from parents, but actually the uptake rate has been very low in the past few seasons. Particularly if you look at the last season in 2022, 2023, we've seen an uptake of 15.4% across the um, the full age groups in the two to 17 years old. And the other problem we see in terms of uptake rates across Ireland is the variation across the different counties as well. So you have some counties such as Dublin and Cork where the uptake rate is about 19.4%, but some other counties such as um, Donegal and Monaghan where the uptake is 6.2%. 6 so you've seen quite a wide variation in, in uptake rates as well. And we had a look at, you know, what the reasons for the no uptake rates are based on what we learned from listening to the parents um, and also thinking around, you know, from an operational perspective, what could be going on. So some of the reasons for the low uptake rate could be due to the short expiry of the um, uh, LAIV as well. So it's only 18 weeks for manufacturing. There's also the COVID-19 restrictions that were there in the last couple of seasons. Um, and there was also a lack of flu cases, I suppose, um, when, the, when the vaccine was introduced uh, initially, um, you, you know, in 2020, 2021, due to the COVID-19. COVID-19 restrictions. There was also competing priorities in one of the seasons with the, with the COVID-19 vaccine being introduced um, around the same time for children aged 5 to 11. But the primary reason, uh, you know, we've concluded is that uh, it's due to access, really. Access is the key reason why, you know, the, the vaccine intentions that parents have said to us isn't really translating into action uh, each season. So, we did pilots in 2021, 2022 season, in a, you know, where we looked at the uptake, you know, we offered the vaccine in school itself, similar to the UK, and we saw the uptake rate uh, was at 60, 63.9%, and the uptake rate in the, you know, in the underlying population before, um, before we went into those schools was 12.4%, because they had the opportunity all the way until the end of November to get it in primary care itself. So the pilot program, when we offered it in school, increased the uptake rate from 12.4% to 76.3% in that particular target population. We're also doing quite a strong 
strong communications campaign and the um, the graph on the right shows the impact of our communications, the HSE communications campaign, particularly in terms of the children's communication campaign. And you'll see that, you know, the impact is, uh, has been noted at 85 percent, uh, clarity at 95 percent, informative at 90 percent and engagement at 79 percent, trust at 84 percent. So really strong communication campaign, really to kind of break some of those myths that, you know, telling people that, you know, flu is there, flu does impact children and flu is very serious for children. So we'll continue to kind of um, uh, inform patients, uh, inform parents about the options that are available and to protect their children each flu season, with the nasal flu vaccine. So um, we also uh, did a survey of the uh, of some of the pharmacists who'd gone into schools um, in 2021-2022 season as well. So we sent it out through our partners um, uh, in the IPU and we had replies from about 14 people, um, uh, 14 pharmacies who'd actually gone you know, had gone into schools. And we know that there were actually more than that uh, in terms of pharmacies and also GPs, actually. We, for example, last season, we had Dr. John Foster, who talked to us at this webinar uh, about his experiences of going into four local primary schools and, and, you know, and some practical tips from him as well. But when we did the survey of pharmacies, I suppose, uh, who'd gone into schools, uh, eight of them had dedicated clinics in school. One of them asked the parents to actually attend the pharmacy. So they had a bit of a mixed, a mixed method model. Um, and they mainly went into primary schools, but in previous seasons when the vaccine was open to other other age groups in secondary school as well, they, they had gone into some secondary schools and they'd also gone into childcare settings and community groups as well. So it was, it was quite a variety of settings they'd gone into, but mainly primary school based. And the school based delivery of the vaccine ranged from about, you know, they offered about 450 to about 10 vaccines. So really in the primary schools, they were offering a large volume of vaccines and the estimated uptake that they reported to us was around 50 percent, ranging from about 30 to 90 percent. And they found that the HSC leaflets and posters and uh, you know, uh, were really useful. And seven of them um, out of the 14, you know, 50% of them completed, the, asked for the consent to be completed beforehand, whereas the other 50% asked for the parents to attend uh, and meet with them. And some of the key learnings from, I suppose, or from the surveys that we did with the pharmacies, you know, they said, you know, they they, they liked having a dedicated consent form. Uh, you know, they wanted to do that earlier on. So they wanted to, you know, the option and uh, resources and hence why we're delivering this webinar at a much earlier stage and with all the resources available for you as well. And they also said that the support from teachers and parents group was critical because, for example, some of the pharmacies received anti-vax letters, etc. Uh, and, you know, one of them had to cancel a, a school clinic because of that. But it's just some of the learnings I think for you to be aware of and so that you can proactively um, go into schools if you're wanting to do that this season. So in terms of improving access to LARV um, this season we have a three-pronged approach so we are um, and the HSE mobile vaccination teams will actually be administering the nasal flu vaccine on site uh, in schools to senior infants within mainstream primary schools. We'll also be going into the primary age special schools where we'll, be, where we'll be offering the vaccine to all children there. And this will be occurring between October and December this uh, this this year. Uh, GPs and pharmacies um, are also, you know, they can also link in with local primary school and childcare settings to offer the vaccine. Um, in primary schools, you know, they're encouraged to kind of um, target the junior infants and also the first of the sixth year class, because obviously we will be um, from the HSC side going in to offer it to the senior infants. Um, and obviously, you know, you can go into other childcare settings such as crashes as well uh, and offer to the younger children there who are above the age of two. But note that this is a private arrangement. We'll be providing you with resources um, uh, that we'll be talking about in a little while. But this is a private arrangement, meaning that, you know, you'll need to contact the schools yourselves um, and, and make that arrangement uh, locally. There's also a pharmacy finder service that we have available on the HSE website, so parents can go and find a local pharmacy that's offering the flu vaccine, uh, and also, you know, uh, more information is available on hsc.ie forward slash flu. Next, I'll be handing over to Dr. Ema Hayes uh, to talk about the dose administration, contraindications and storage with regards to LAIV. Thank you, Ema. Hi, can you hear me okay, Aparna? Yes, I can hear you, Ema. Thanks. Yeah, perfect. So I'm going to talk about LAIV dose administration, contraindications and storage. So the vaccine is Fluence Tetra. It's a live attenuated influenza vaccine. They're supplied in a box containing 10 single applicators. They're a pre-filled nasal applicator, and each applicator contains 0.2 mils nasal milliliters 
nasal suspension. It's ready to use, no reconstitution or dilution is needed, and it should be pale yellow, clear to opalescent. Small white particles can appear, and you can see what it looks like there and what the box should look like. So how many doses of LAIV are required? In the licensed documentation, all previously unvaccinated children are recommended two doses four weeks apart. However, there is ev evidence of adequate efficacy after one dose of LAIV in healthy children. So in Ireland, the National Immunisation Advisory Committee recommends one dose for healthy children. In the UK and Finland, they also recommend one dose for healthy children. So in this table, you can see how many doses are recommended for each um, cohort. So in the medically at risk group of children, for those who are two to eight years old, if they've never had any influenza vaccine before, they're recommended two doses four weeks apart. However, if they have had any influenza vaccine before, they're only recommended one dose. In the medically at risk group who are nine to 17 years of age, whether they've had a previous vaccine is not relevant. They're recommended one dose. And in healthy children aged two to 12 years, whether they've had a previous vaccination is not relevant, they're recommended one dose. Administration, it's given as a divided dose in both nostrils, 0 0.1 milliliter per nostril. The dose divider clip on the applicator allows for the administration of 0 0.1 milliliters in each nostril. The child should breathe normally. There is no need to actively inhale or sniff the vaccine. So the steps in intranasal administration of LAIV. Step one, take one applicator out of the fridge at a time. Check the expiry date. Step two, remove the nozzle tip protector. Do not remove the dose divider clip. Step three is to place the tip of the applicator inside the right nostril with the child in an upright sitting position and advise the child to breathe normally. There is no need for them to inhale or sniff. Step four, depress the plunger quickly until the dose divider clip prevents further administration. Step five, pinch and remove the dose divider clip. Step six, insert the applicator inside the left nostril and depress the plunger as quickly as possible until all the vaccine has been given. Then dispose of the nasal applicator in the sharp spin and record that the vaccine has been given. And that's just a video on available on hse.ie on how to give the vaccine. LAIV contraindications are anaphylaxis following a previous dose of influenza vaccine or any constituents, except ovalbumin. I'll discuss that when I go through precautions. Those with severe neutropenia to avoid an acute vaccine related febrile episode. This does not apply to those with primary autoimmune neutropenia who can get the flu vaccine unless they have any other contraindications. Those on combination checkpoint inhibitors, for example, ipilimumab with nivolumab because of a potential association with immune related adverse reactions. Then some further contraindications are asthma. If there is an acute exacerbation of symptoms, such as increased wheezing and or additional bronchodilator treatment in the last 72 hours, or if they have severe asthma if on regular oral steroids, or if they have had previous ICU or critical care admission for asthma, in which case you should seek some advice about whether they can have it. Significant immunosuppression due to disease or treatment. Children who live with severely immunosuppressed persons, for example, someone post a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Concomitant use of aspirin or salicylates. Influenza antiviral medications within the previous 48 hours. Pregnancy. 
those post a cochlear implant until the risk of a CSF leak has resolved, in which case consult with the relevant specialist and those with a cranial CSF leak. QIV should be given if LIIV is contraindicated, provided the QIV is not also contraindicated. The following are not contraindications to LAIV, asymptomatic HIV infection, and children receiving topical or inhaled corticosteroids, or low-dose systemic corticosteroids, or those who were on replacement therapy corticosteroids, for example, for adrenal insufficiency. Then LAIV precautions LAIV should be deferred until recovered if they have an acute severe febrile illness. In the case of egg allergy, NIAC advises that LAIV has a low ovalbumin content of less than or equal to 0.024 micrograms per dose. Therefore, it can be given to children with confirmed egg anaphylaxis or egg allergy in a primary care setting or a school setting. The exception, however, is children who have required ICU admission for a previous severe anaphylaxis to egg, who should be given LAIV in hospital. LAIV is the preferred vaccine for children who have required admission to ICU for a previous severe anaphylaxis to egg as the intranasal route is less likely to cause systemic reactions and it should be given in hospital. And then LAIV after vaccination, Paracetamol or ibuprofen can be given for common side effects. And they should avoid aspirin or salicylates for four weeks unless it's medically indicated, as Ray's syndrome has been reported after salicylate use during wild type influenza infection. And they should avoid anti influenza antiviral medication for two weeks. Flu vaccine storage. Influenza vaccines should be stored at plus two to plus eight degrees Celsius. Keep the pre-filled syringes in the outer carton in order to protect them from sunlight. The vaccines are sensitive to heat and cold. Heat speeds up the decline in potency of most vaccines, reducing their shelf life. Do not freeze. If a vaccine has been frozen, it should not be used. Freezing may cause increased reactogenicity and a loss of potency for some vaccines, and it can also cause hairline cracks in the container, leading to contamination of the contents. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ima. Uh, I'm just going to hand you over to um, Dr. Alice Quinn, who will be taking us through the commonly asked questions. Thanks, Alice. Regarding co administration, all influenza vaccines and other vaccines, including COVID-19 vaccines for those aged five and over, may be administered at the same time or at any interval. LIV can be given at the same time or at any time before or after any other live vaccine, for example, the MOM vaccine or the varicella vaccine or any non-live vaccine. The only exceptions are for PCV13 for children aged 12 to 23 months, influenza vaccines should be separated by one week due to the risk of febrile convulsions. As a precaution for children six months to four years, other vaccines, including the flu vaccine, should be separated from COVID-19 vaccines in this age group by 14 days. Next slide, please. Regarding viral shedding, vaccinated children shed the virus for a few days after vaccination through sneezing or coughing. However, the vaccine virus is weakened, so it is much less likely or able to spread from person to person than flu viruses than normally spread. The amount of virus that children shed is normally below the levels needed to pass on the infection to others. The virus does not survive for long outside the body. It is not necessary for children to be off school during the period when the vaccine is being given. The only exception is the very small number of children 
who are extremely immunocompromised. These children are usually advised not to attend school anyway because of the high risk of being in contact with infections that spread in school. There are no reported cases of live vaccine uh, virus transmission in healthcare workers who administer the vaccine or in close contacts, including those who are pregnant. As a precautionary measure, however, very severely immunocompromised healthcare workers should not administer the LAIB. Next slide, please. Regarding the expiry date of the LIV, note it is much shorter than other vaccines, 18 weeks after the date of manufacture. The expiry date is written on the side of the nasal applicator as days, months and year, and is the last date the vaccine can be administered. The expiry date may not necessarily be the last date of the month. Always check the expiry date carefully. Next slide, please. LIIV, what to do if when you're administering the vaccine, the child sneezes or their nose drips. The vaccine does not need to be repeated here. LIIV is immediately absorbed after administration and there is a surplus of attenuated virus particles in the vaccine required for immunity. What if the LIV is only given into one nostril? The vaccine does not need to be repeated here. A 0.1 ml dose given into one nostril contains enough attenuated viral particles to induce an immune response. What if all of the vaccine is given into the same nostril? The vaccine, again, does not need to be repeated here. Next slide, please. Can a LAIB vaccine be administered to children living with somebody who is immunocompromised? The NIAC guidelines advise that children who live with severely immunocompromised persons requiring isolation, for example, post hemopoietic stem cell transplant, should not receive the quadrivalent live attenuated influenza va nasal vaccine. This is a precautionary measure. As the vaccine viruses are cold adapted, they cannot replicate efficiently at body temperature. Millions of doses of the LAIV have been administered in the US for over 10 years and serious illness amongst immunocompromised contacts inadvertently exposed to vaccine virus has never been observed. Any child living with a person who is immunocompromised by treatment or disease may have the LAIV vaccine unless the person has to live in a total isolation room. Next slide, please. In terms of adverse reactions, nasal congestion is a very common local reaction. In terms of general adverse reactions, malaise is very common. Decreased appetite, headache, myalgia and fever are common too. Fever is no more frequently frequent than the following other recommended childhood vaccines and is generally mild and resolves in a few days. Very rarely, Immediate allergic reactions may occur. Very rare reports of Guillain-Barre syndrome have been observed in the post-marketing setting following flu vaccination. The risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome is several times greater following influenza illness than following the influenza vaccination. The summary of product characteristics for each of the vaccine is available at the Health Products Regulatory Authority, www.hpra.ie. Note, mild fever less than 39 degrees, nasal congestion, rhinitis, malaise, and decreased appetite are common reactions expected after the LAIV. Symptoms associated with the administration of the LAIV usually take about 24 hours to develop and usually resolve with out treatment within 72 hours. Next slide, please. Post-vaccination. Vaccine recipients should be observed for at least 15 minutes after vaccination. If this is not practical, vaccine recipients should wait in the vicinity for 15 minutes. As when giving any vaccine, the availability of protocols, equipments and drugs necessary for management of anaphylaxis should be checked before each vaccination se session. You should also provide post-vaccination advice, advice on the possible adverse reactions, and advise about reporting any side effects to the HPRA. 
it take and advise it takes about two weeks after vaccination to have protection against the flu. And there is a chance they may still get the vaccine. So it's important to follow public health advice. Next slide, please. I'll just Thank hand you. back to you, Apana. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alice. So I'll just go on to talk about some of the practical considerations. And I think I've seen a couple of the questions coming into the chat bar, and hopefully this next section will answer some of those queries for you. So next, we're going to be talking about a bit about the operational pathway for school-based delivery. And one of the questions in the chat was around, you know, um, can do parents need to attend um, the vaccination session with the child or can they give consent beforehand, similar to our school-based vaccinations? So I suppose the answer to that, and we had a discussion with our partners as well, um, for example, the IPU and the PSI, and the, um, the answer to that really is that if it's a school-based vaccination, so you're going to a school-based setting, you can get consent from parents beforehand and that can be used on the day as a valid consent so parents wouldn't need to attend. In a non-school-based setting, for example, if you're in a crash or in a community group or, an, or another organisation, we are recommending that parents do attend um, for the vaccination, provide the consent um, at that point of vaccination so they are with the parents, uh, with the child at the time of vaccination. So what I just wanted to highlight here was the operational pathway um, you know, that could possibly be used for school-based delivery and this is what we use for our HSE school teams as well. So I'll just run through that just in case people aren't familiar with how it practically works um, you know, on the ground uh, where, when teams are planning for a school-based vaccination service. So again, as I said, this is only recommended for children in school and uh, uh, in a school-based setting and not in a other community groups, etc. setting. So it's a school-based program, a pathway that we use um, that, could, that, that you could consider using as well. So schools are first contacted and a specific timeline for communication with the schools is established uh, based on a vaccination session day. So you'd also confirm the actions such as when you're going to be distributing the packs and when you're going to be collecting the consent paperwork. So that's the first box there. Then what you do is you'd in, you you issue the invitations and the consent forms as agreed um, to the uh, school and the school will basically send them to the parents in the children's school bag. The parents will take the consent forms, they'll read through the information leaflet, the letter you'd be sending them, um, and then they'd return the consent form in, the, in an envelope um, back to the school. So what the school will then do is they'll collect all of the consent um, paperwork and then they'll um, in the enclosed envelopes and then there you will go to the school and collect all of those back um, at least two weeks prior to the session date because you'll need some time to review those consent forms and I'll explain why in a second as well. So once you get the consent paperwork back, you, a clinically trained staff member will need to review the consent forms and they'll need to kind of traffic light assess them. So they'll either say the consent has been refused, so the person shouldn't be vaccinated, the consent's either given, but you may have a clinical query that comes up in the consent, so you'll need to call up the parent and clarify that question with them before you go into the vaccination session itself. Um, the consent may be given and there may be no clinical query and you're very happy to kind of go ahead with the vaccination. That's great. Uh, and that hopefully that will be the majority of the cases. Uh, and then consent may be given, but then you assess the patient as, OK, this child will require a second dose um, based on some of the information that EMA has given you. For example, if they're aged two to eight and they've never had a flu vaccine before and they're in a clinically risk group. So if they satisfy all of those three conditions, you may have to kind of consider, you know, uh, that they'll need a second dose uh, four weeks later. And there could also be a, a fifth category, I suppose, the consent form never comes back to you. So you sent out 30 consent forms and only 20 come back to you as well. So there's five different things that happen when you, when you review the paperwork, I suppose. So um, once you've reviewed the paperwork, so that can take a bit of time, um, you'll actually on the day the vaccination team will pack and transport the vaccine, the consent paperwork, and you'll take all of the equipment that you need to the school session. And a list of that equipment that we propose that you have with you is also on the toolkit that I'll be talking about in a second as well. So when you're on the day in the vaccination clinic, we are recommending that there's at least two trained personnel, one of which is the vaccinators. Um, and these two trained personnel should be trained in the management of anaphylaxis and VLS as well, and children's VLS as well. And that's required um, at each vaccination clinic. And these people should at least remain in the vaccination venue for at least 30 minutes following the last vaccination. So that's the recommended approach that we take. And we're also recommending for you as well. 
And we're also recommending that the vaccination record is inputted in real time. So when you actually administer the vaccine straight away, please do you put that vaccination record onto your GP vax system or pharma vax or to your GP practice management system. So however you send that records back to us, put it in there and make sure that it's sent back to us so that you get paid and we have the vaccination record as well. And it's really important that you do this step in real time where possible, because as I said before, there's HSC teams that are going into the mainstream schools and offering it to senior infants, but obviously you may be offering it to the other children. So it's just really important because there's multiple channels for children to get vaccinated, that there is a vaccination record available in the system that all vaccinators can see so that a child doesn't get um, two doses accidentally when they're not supposed to. After you finish the vaccination record inputting, you know, we always recommend that you complete a vaccination session report form. There's one available as a template in the appendix. And this is really for your own record to see how many people did I do, etc. And we're hoping to send out a survey at the end of the whole program as well uh, to GPs and pharmacies to see, you know, if you've gone into schools, how many people did you vaccinate? And you'll be able to get that information really quickly. And if you're happy to send that to us, that would be that would be great in terms of for our evaluation purposes. And then we'll also be asking you to store the LEIV consent forms in line with your local records retention policy as well. So just also remember prior to the vaccination session, all queries should be dealt with so that no child attends for vaccination with an outstanding query. This is really for your benefit so that you're not there, uh, you know, with any questions before a child is vaccinated. And a system should be available locally to deal with immunisation queries or concerns from parents and legal guardians and also the schools. So there should always be a contact information provided to the parents because, you know, if there's a change, in, you know, if they change their mind or if there's been a change in the clinical status of the child as well, that they're not able to get vaccinated, it's important that you're informed about that before you attend the vaccination session because there could be a time lag between when they complete the vaccine consent form and when they um when they uh, when they attend the vaccination session. So parents and legal guardians should know that when the vaccination session is going to be administered as well. Uh, and they should also know that, you know, they can they have the right to withdraw consent or, or inform the vaccination team of any changes to the vaccine consent form at any time in advance of the vaccine being administered. And as I said, it's really important that your contact information is provided to the parents and also the schools as well. The composition of the immunization team should be agreed locally in advance and will depend on the number of students in the school and the amount of space they have, you know, and your resources as well. As I said, you know, in the HSU side of the house, you know, we are recommending that there's at least two trained personnel who are able to undertake anaphylaxis management and basic life support in each vaccination clinic. Because as I always tell people, you know, I wouldn't want to be there, you know, in the very rare circumstance that something, you know, bad happens in a in a school based setting in, in, with you know in a, you, you want to have at least two pairs of hands who are trained and are able to support you with those processes so really from a from a safety perspective it, it is a, it is advised that there are two trained pa two trained personnel as you know vaccinators themselves you know they will be trained in anaphylaxis and basic life support anyway so one ad additional person that could be a second vaccinator or a trained personnel is fine as well. Uh, and also remember that vaccinators should be working within their scope of practice as well. So for pharmacists, uh, go to the PSI website. There is a wealth of resource there as well for you to have a look at. And, and you should be working within your scope of practice in line with uh, your profession. Um, so when we go to schools uh, in the HSC side of the house, we actually do pull together what we call a parent pack. So this is what we send in the school bags back to the parents to complete. So within these packs, we put an envelope in and within these packs, we have a letter within there and we're suggesting that you have a letter as well. And we usually, you know, we, we would translate it into English and Irish for the parents uh, as the schools require us to. Um, and uh, this is a letter kind of basically saying, you know, we're going to be coming to your school on this this day uh, and, you know, we'll be offering the flu vaccine. This is the information. Please complete the consent form and, you know, giving them information on how they can contact you as well uh, and when they should be sending the consent form back. So all of that information, there's template letters available in our toolkit that you can adapt, but you will need to adapt them uh, and translate them yourselves. Uh, in this parent pack, we'd also recommend that there's the information leaflet as well. So um, again, we provide them, there, there are copies of the English and Irish versions that are available on our website that you can just download and send with the pack if you wanted to. Um, 
there's also consent forms that we put in the packs more most importantly and again we have english and irish versions of the hse consent forms that you can use and we're recommending that you use because i'll go through in a second um why we have all of the questions we have clinical questions that we have in our consent forms and you'd all, all also provide as a courtesy and, and on envelopes as well so because this is patient confidential information that they'll be returning back to the schools you'd want to put it in an envelope for the parents that they can return it back to the school in a safe and secure way um, so just in terms of to touch on consent because there's a lot of you know we, we always get questions on this uh, i suppose during the covid 19 era we produced a lot of guidance um, on our website that's available for you that you can read about who can give consent for a young person under the age of 16 what if one parent consents and the other person the other parent doesn't consent so all of those scenarios are covered within those um within those uh you know links that i've, I've provided there so uh, have a look at those they're, they're really informative but i suppose in terms of in, in essence with consent what we say is that if you're age 16 or 17 you can actually consent to receive the vaccine yourself if you're under the age of 16 um for those children aged 5 to 15 years old uh, in other words parents or legal guardians will need to provide that consent um and the child provides the assent that means that the child says yes i'm happy to get the vaccine or they agree to it uh, for uh, under the age of five uh, for children aged two to four years old the parent and legal guardian again provides that formal consent for the vaccine and generally you seek assent from the ch child age five or older but sometimes younger depending on the child you know if they're if they're there uh, if you feel that it's suitable that's fine you can ask them for assent as well but i suppose it's important that under the age of 16 it is the parent and legal guardian who provides the consent for the vaccine just to go through our HSE consent form, I'm not going to go through the full consent form, but I'm just going through the clinical parts of that question. So uh, part four is the screening questions that are really important. I'm just going to go through why we have these questions in there, you know, because sometimes we're always asked, you know, why are there so many questions on your consent form? Uh, it's just to cover all of all the, you know, the clinical basis and scenarios so that you're confident going into the vaccination session that a child is suitably um, suitable for vaccination. So the first question is, you know, has your child already received the flu vaccines? Um, since September, or do they have an appointment with their GP or pharmacist? Particularly if they're going into schools, uh, they may have uh, they, they may have already had the flu vaccine. So if it's a yes, do not vaccinate them. The second question is if they've had a severe allergic reaction to any medications or vaccines, um, and then they should be providing you the details. And if they don't, do call them up and clarify what that is, because if there is an anaphylaxis following a, a previous dose of the flu vaccine or any of its constituents that are you know except for valubrimin, you shouldn't be vaccinating them. Uh, and the next one is about the ovalbumin um, question, I suppose, if you're, you know, this is about, you know, has your child needed, a, you know, ICU admission following a severe, you know, uh, allergic reaction to eggs? If it's a yes, then um, you shouldn't be vaccinating them either. The next one is, has your child been diagnosed with asthma? Um, if it's a yes, you should look at the next a series of questions because they talk about, you know, uh, does your child take regular steroids for asthma or has your child ever been admitted to ICU or critical care for asthma? Do they take aspirin or salicylate? Do they have a severely weakened immune system? Do they live with anyone? Um, having treatment that severely affects the immune system do they take combination in, 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 combination checkpoint inhibitors or do they have a condition that's causing a csf leak or had a recent cochlear implant if they respond yes to any of these we would not recommend that you vaccinate them with laib either the next couple of questions is about you know if they've received a flu vaccine in the last year or if they've received the flu vaccine before uh, and the reason why we ask this question is is to determine if they require a second dose four weeks later and i'll talk about that in the next page in a second if they if they meet any of the clinical conditions on that so just one other contraindication that we ask about is a neutropenia question uh, if they have severe neutropenia if yes you shouldn't be vaccinating them either so as i mentioned you know um some of the some of the children under the age of nine if they've never had a flu vaccine before and if they have these underlying health conditions they should receive a second dose of the flu vaccine um and so this question enables you to determine that so if they've answered yes to this question and they're aged two to eight years old and they've never had a flu vaccine you should be sending the parents a letter regarding their second dose so really um you know they, they need to second dose uh, four weeks later and then we also have some questions in there, you know, where we ask the parents, you know, there may be a change in the circumstance of the child, for example, they may have received antiviral medication the previous two days, 
or there's been an acute exacerbation of their asthma in the last uh, three days, or um, they, uh, you know, they've gotten a dose of the flu vaccine with a GPR pharmacist in the meantime, or they're suddenly unwell, uh, we do ask them that they con contact you by letting you know that you know, there's been a change in circumstances as well. And we all, obviously the other contraindication that we don't go through a, in specific detail, but we do also make it known to parents that you know that this vaccine is not suitable for people who are pregnant either, because the vaccine is licensed until the age of 17, I suppose. Uh, but if it's yes, obviously the parents do contact you with any of this. You don't you don't you don't offer the child the vaccine. Uh, it's also important for this reason that your contact details are up to date. From a practical basis of ordering the flu vaccine, I think you would have all received our flu letters that were sent out through the National Cold Chain Service. Uh, so you can order the vaccines online through ordervaccines.ie, uh, which is our um, online ordering portal by, from the National Cold Chain Service. Please uh, look at your order dates and order per those dates. Uh, and the flu Fluence Tetra can be ordered as required based on vaccination clinics planned uh, with fortnightly deliveries um, that started on the 25th of September. Um, and note that the first batch of vaccines that we'll be, uh, we'll be sending you will be expiring on the 29th of December 2023. But as per always, you know, we're giving you an expiry date there, but always check the vaccine before administering it to a client. Um, and also the uh, post-vaccination tear pad leaflets, you know, the, the, the record that you give to the parents, um, that's actually delivered with the vaccine itself. So you'll receive that with the vaccine when you place the order. And this should be completed and provided to the to the child uh, or the parent after vaccination. And please only order the amount of vaccine that you require before your next delivery. As we said, you know, always provide two weekly deliveries so um please plan your clinics accordingly and you're able to order as you go throughout the season uh, just to touch on some of the resources that we have um so you know we'll be starting the launch of the communications campaign on the 2nd of october on the 9th of october we'll be starting a dedicated laib campaign um that particular week because we felt that it required that special focus in terms of the parents, uh, but the overall flu launch will be from the 2nd of October um, and it'll be part of our winter vaccination campaign, I suppose. So we're, you know, to reduce the vaccine fatigue among, uh, you know, recipients. So we'll be talking about COVID, we'll be talking about flu, we'll also be talking about PPV23 this year as well. Uh, and really the target groups for the winter um, for the flu campaign really are the children. So that's a key priority for us. It's also the at-risk groups and also um, health and care workers as well. As per previous years, I suppose, um, it, the real objective of these communication campaign is to make sure that we increase the uptake rates and everyone who could who's eligible for the free flu vaccine get the information that they need to make an informed decision and that they're getting the information from trusted resources as well. Um, just to say, uh, sorry, there's a spelling error in the immunization there, but if you go to immunization.ie, spelled correctly, uh, you'll actually go to our um, a resources page for vaccinators such as yourself. And within that, if you go to the health and care worker resources and click on flu vaccine, you'll be able to see a list of resources there. And one of the tabs there that we've you know, specially created for you is LAIB resources for primary care. So this is really for general practice in primary care. And we have within their leaflets, consent forms, um, a copy of the tear pad, what it looks like uh, again, and, and posters as well, all available in English and Irish. Um, so within that resources, we have the toolkit. So this really goes into quite a lot of detail about what you require for, you know, school-based approach to vaccination. So if you are going into primary schools, what are the considerations you require? What are the resources you require? What are the templates that you may think about? So that's all within that uh, particular toolkit. We also have consent forms available on the website, as I said, and there's also plenty of uh, frequently asked questions as well. Uh, uh, and, you know, if there's any additional questions that we notice today on the chat, we always keep adding more to that resource so please do use that uh, as you go along through the flu season because uh, hopefully some you know that's already been captured there and likely that someone's asked that question before to us and uh, as per always you know we have our hse land modules so these are our bread and butter in terms of how we deliver the clinical information to you as well so uh, we have the e-learning modules there's two of them on the laiv vaccine that we would strongly encourage all vaccinators to undertake before vaccinating there's also algorithms that are available 
and leaflets and posters and note that you know the patient side i suppose the the information leaflets and the posters etc they're all available uh, on the patient facing website which is hse.ie forward slash flu that comes from the central hsc side of the house and if you select flu vaccine information materials there's one of the tabs in there you'll be able to access all of these kind of algorithms etc and the algorithms i find particularly useful for vaccinators just to kind of think you know is that patient eligible for the flu vaccine and there's also further resources for example i said as i mentioned uh, the patient facing website is hse.ie forward slash flu for you guys as vaccinators and healthcare professionals it's immunization.ie hse land has our um, e-learning modules not only on laiv but it also has modules on qiv and ppv23 you can always contact us with any inquiries on immunization at hse.ie and alice and Ema and other smos and our adons are on call to answer those questions for you um we also have um the RCPI, I should say, has the NIAC guidelines on their website uh, that's available there. And um, you can also get the manufacturer's patient information leaflet and the SMPC or summary of product characteristic for each vaccine that has the ingredients, etc., in detail on the HPRO website. So uh, I suppose the all it leaves me is uh, to say thank you to our uh, to our presenters this um, afternoon and we've just got two more minutes but I see that there's been plenty of uh, questions in the chat that both Alice and um, uh, Ima have been answering away if there's any questions that we haven't come to at the moment because we only have a minute left we'll go through those um, chat and we'll add that onto our um, onto our website uh, FAQs and if you have any further questions always uh, feel free to email us at immunization at hse.ie and it just leaves me to say thank you to Dr Alice Quinn and also Dr Ima Hayes uh, and for maybe from the team um, for supporting us with this webinar.